Are we live? Good evening. I think that's probably at the start of every recording of a live stream. Are we on? Is this thing on? Because if you're going to live stream, you might as well make it as awkward as possible. Embrace it. Uh, also, I should lean over more because then you can see how the hair is thinning at the back of my head better on the live stream because either that or I should lower the camera so that when I lean over, you can't see that. Maybe we could put the camera up here and look up at me. Right, and then people could count the nose hairs and uh, that. <clears throat> How awkward can we make this? I think in the back's probably pretty good then. All right, let's start tonight with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you uh, for your goodness to us. We're thankful for the rain outside. And, and as much as we uh, see the rain sometimes as an inconvenience and the coolness, we are grateful for it. Know that uh, the earth needs it and we need it and, and uh, the fields need it, the wells need it and all of that. And we're grateful for it. I do pray that you would continue to provide for our needs and to meet the needs of those in our church. I pray that as we meet together tonight, that we would honor your name and glorify you for it's in Jesus name that we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to start off with hymn number 473. Victory in Jesus. <clears throat> I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing of his yeah, a revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing the old redemption story some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He 
plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. All right, back to him number 417. And then it's real easy to turn to the next one because it's right next door. Of course, for those watching online, it's turned to for you. It gets clicked right through. 417, no one understands like Jesus. <clears throat> no one understands like Jesus. He's a friend beyond compare. Meet him at the throne of mercy. He is waiting for you there. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim. No one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on him. No one understands like Jesus. Every woe he sees and feels. Tenderly he whispers comfort. And the broken heart he heals. No one understands like Jesus. When the days are dark and grim. No one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on him. No one understands like Jesus when the foes of life assail. You should never be discouraged. Jesus cares and will not fail. None understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim, no one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on him. No one understands like Jesus when you falter on the way. Though you fail him, sadly fail him. He will pardon you today. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim. No one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on him. And right across page 418, just a slight key change, tempo change. Same theme though. Is there a heart or bound by sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the cross each burden bearing all your anxiety leave it there all your anxiety all your care bring to the mercy seat leave it there never a burden he cannot bear never a friend like jesus no other friend so keen to help you no other friend so quick to hear no other place to leave your burden. No other one to hear your prayer. All your anxiety, all your care. Mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. Come then at once, delay 
no longer heed his entreaty kind and sweet you need not fear a disappointment you shall find peace at the mercy seat all your anxiety all your care bring to the mercy seat leave it there never a burden he cannot bear never a friend like Jesus. All right, items tonight for prayer, praise, testimony, thanksgiving. I have weird thanksgiving. I've been working at getting back into running, and yesterday I did four miles on the treadmill for the first time. I haven't run that far since the 4th of July, so that was a, a small victory that felt really good about. So, Al, we're the same age. You should see if you can do that. What? Easy? Especially with the new knee, right? And your, your therapist and surgeon would be on board with you trying to run four miles, right? Totally, they'd be, go for it. You should have asked uh, after the surgery, will I be able to run a marathon? I, oh, sure, yeah, no problem. Oh, good, because I never have before. You know, Saw some of our local runners in the Chicago Marathon today. One of them did the sh Chicago Marathon in, it wasn't two hours, was it? No. The first finisher in the Chicago Marathon finished the marathon in two hours and like one minute. Since a marathon is 26.2 miles, that's running at 13 miles an hour, which is three miles an hour faster than my treadmill will go. That's pretty impressive. I think of our local runners, one finished in three and a half hours, one finished in four, and one finished in five. And you might think, wow, they were really slow. What I think is, that person ran for five hours. And I don't care if they're not going very fast, they were running for five hours and they weren't the last finisher. I have a terrific respect for those that finish a marathon in any amount of time. The guy that finished it in two hours though, I've run for two hours. I know I can do that. <laughs> but but I only ran half the distance that he did in my two hours, and uh, so, or almost half the distance he did. But still, it's a praise to be uh, back to running and to uh, do four miles. Jen, when I came home, I, I said, four. She goes, are you gonna be able to walk tomorrow? I said, oh yeah, sure, I hope. <laughs> my legs don't feel that bad. <clears throat> Yeah, last time. They recommended at his age just laying low and letting it heal on its own and not pushing it because it would have to likely be redone getting it that young. And I thought that's only a few years ahead of when I had my repair, so I guess I need to take it easier. Should have made you load those big chunks of wood. We did team lifting for the big chunks of wood into the trailer. I told Ben afterwards, I said, 10 years ago, I was loading pieces like that in the trailer by myself. Well, no, that was after I had had the hernia. <laughs> I can't remember what was happening around the time I had the hernia. I was carrying the church's 40-foot ladder around by myself, and I think the neighbor and I had carried a 
wood stove down into the basement together and the what? Oh, the wood from Uncle David. He had a silver oak in his in his yard that was five feet across, and uh, the people that cut down the tree cut it into like eighteen to twenty inch chunks for him. And he said I could have the wood, so I took Gary McChesney's trailer over there and rolled the pieces whole up his tailgate, and his tailgate was never straight again after that. And I think I put like three or four pieces of wood on the trailer and drove it back to Sinclairville because that's all I could handle behind the Windstar on a small trailer that's only supposed to hold 1,500 pounds. And then I had to move them around to uh, split them because we used a hydraulic splitter. And if we use wedges, you just put a wedge in it and hit it. If you use a hydraulic splitter, you have to get it under the splitter first. Yeah, I think that's probably what caused it. That's probably the, the likely culprit. That was that time. At that time, those pieces of wood, I think, were taller than Austin. So, not anymore. No. Any word on Timothy and Titus? Have they moved more step down? Are they out of the hospital? Yeah. That's a big plus. They were how big? Three, four pounds? I had cousins that were twins that were 10 pounds each. I was a light baby at only six and a half pounds, two months early. Same hospital? Um, probably. Oh. So we're dealing in Hawaii, right? Yeah. So, yeah, probably. Because, like, if you're at, in, up in Buffalo, the children go to, like, Oshai, and the, the mother goes over here, and if there's something wrong with the father, he goes over there. And Anything else for praise or prayer tonight? Well, Willie missed the prayer or the praise this morning. Austin and Alicia are expecting in May, so so there's a new grandbaby on the way. I saw someone said their grandson Kazoo, and one of my kids said they named their grandson Kazoo. I said no, grandparents don't get to name their grandson. It's probably a good thing. Alicia doesn't even know what my favorite name is for boys. Austin remembers quite well. Anyone else know? You heard Austin say it. Maher Shawal Hashbaz. Because that is just like the most interesting name in the Bible. Next to Nebuchadnezzar, probably. Ranks right up there. All right, well, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we continue. Father, again, we thank you for your goodness. We're thankful for answers to prayer. Uh, for a new little one on the way, we're thankful for that praise. We're thankful that Austin's been feeling better. Uh, as he's been taking it easy to recover from the hernia. Uh, we're thankful, uh, I'm thankful to be able to be running again and, and uh, to be able to get a, a few miles on on the treadmill in and, and uh, grateful to uh, be working back up in that way. Uh, we're thankful for the work that you've provided, for the provision you've made for our needs. Uh, we're thankful for uh, health care that different ones are receiving and, and uh, we continue to pray for uh, Al's brother, that is recovering for, as he recovers from a heart attack and gets strengthened, we pray for Ella Davis recovering from her skin graft surgery. We pray for Amos as he's recovering in the hospital, as well as for Timothy and Titus, that they would continue to gain weight and strength and, and uh, be able to grow well there. We're thankful Carol has recovered from her, her uh, pneumonia. Uh, we're thankful that uh, Mary Parment has got some answers regarding her health and Yet we continue to pray for strength for upcoming appointments for her as well and I pray that you would bless as they, they uh, seek to find answers there. Uh, we're thankful for your meeting our needs here in this church and the needs of our church families and pray that you would continue to do so uh, day by day and week by week. 
Again, we pray as we meet together tonight that we would honor you as we look into your word and, and pray that it would be an encouragement and a challenge to us. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Psalm 27 tonight. Title tonight, Nothing to Fear. Is anyone afraid of anything this week? I'm sure there was no anxiety whatsoever about starting in a new school. Uh, I'm sure there was no anxiety over, over different things. When we start off Psalm 27, David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Those two questions he starts with. Whom shall I fear and of whom shall I be afraid? If that question was presented to us as a question, Dave, David's not asking it as a question like fill in the blank. But if someone asked us, who will you fear and of whom would you be afraid? We can make lists. We can make lists of people that we could be afraid of. Uh, especially if you watch the news too much. Uh, we can be afraid of the government, uh, what the government is doing. What the, we can be afraid of the other political party. I figure that's a nice way to balance it, right? Just, just in case, you know, whether there's a D or an R by your name or you're blue or you're red, everyone fears the other political party. Uh, we, can, we can fear people who disagree with us. We can fear people who are different from us. You ever had that happen where you feared someone that appeared different from you only to find out that you had a lot in common and uh, they're not all that different? We can be afraid of what people think of us. We can be afraid of what people might say to us or how people might respond to us. We can be afraid of what people would do to us. We could be afraid of friends, family. We could be afraid of a lot of people. So when David says, whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? This isn't an invitation to take out your pencil and say, oh, well, I'll give you a list. However, if we are going to take out our pens and pencils and make a list, we have to understand that David is what David is going to tell us helps us take all of those names off of the list. Because when David says, whom shall I fear? And of whom shall I be afraid? He's saying, even though there may be people out there that I could fear, I don't have to. And he starts off in verse 1 by, why isn't he afraid? The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. That's a great verse. Uh, if you struggle with fear, if you struggle with anxiety, that's a great verse to keep in mind. And by keep in mind, I mean keep in mind, not tattoo it to your forehead or wear a, a, something on your head that has it, memorize it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David declares, we have no one to fear. First of all, because the Lord was his light and his salvation. Nothing to fear. I might as well stick with the Lord of the Rings, right? When Frodo was in Arendelle? Arendelle? Where was, where was he? No, Frodo. Oh, not Arendelle. It wasn't Arendelle then. Rivendell. I think I saw parts of Frozen years ago. Not enough to let it go, though, apparently. See what I did there? Thank you, Jeremiah. That was an appropriate response, and I appreciate it. <laughs> when he was in Rivendale, he was given the star, the light of... That was not Rivendale. Where, was, where did he get the light? The where? Lothlorien. Okay. You know what's going to happen now is this week, Benjamin's going to say, Hey, Dad. It's time to watch it again. <laughs> and Dad's going to say, you're probably right. He got this light when all other lights go out. That he didn't, where he would be afraid, he had a light. And, and I think when he met up against, oh, sure. Shelob. I was like, what's the name of the big spider? 
Yeah, you all laugh, but try to stand up here and remember anything, and it's not that easy. <laughs> and he went up against Shelob. He took that out, and he knew he did not have to be afraid. He was still kind of afraid. But the Lord was his light. What's the importance of a light? Well, it illuminates the darkness. Uh, there, there are those of us that don't mind walking around in, in, in the dark. I will come over here late at night and I will walk through the entire church without turning on a light because I appreciate the challenge, especially if I'm not wearing shoes because <laughs> it's the bigger challenge to protect your toes and kind of counting the steps out. My brother at one point told me I could drive to work blindfolded. Now that I'd like to see. I can walk around here without the light on, but I'll put my hand out when I know that like the end of a pew is coming up. I'll put it out at the right height, kind of like a feeler, and I'll be able to make it through there. I'd like to see my older brother drive to work without, without, uh, with a blindfold on. But when we have a light, there's an advantage. We can see what's there. It, it portrays things clearly. When things are dark, we can fear things that aren't there. When you hear a noise in the dark, do you imagine that it is the least scary thing that it could be or the most scary thing that it could be? Did you hear that? I bet that was a giant rat. Now, if we're in our garage, it's possible that it is a giant rat. We're working on that one. It's probably a monster. Well, no, it's not. You turn on the light and find out that a piece of paper just drifted off of something and landed. And in the quiet and darkness, it sounds really loud. But when there's light, you don't have to be afraid because you can see what it is. Light reveals things for what they truly are. And when God is our light, it illuminates those fears that we might have for what they truly are. Whom do we have to, to be afraid of? Whom do we have to fear? His illumination, it's, it's what allowed him to see. He wasn't walking in limited or low light. He could see clearly. The Lord was his salvation. And when we hear the word salvation, we think, of course, of salvation from sins. But David also understood that God was his salvation from trouble, his deliverance, his safety, his safety net. I talked this morning about crossing that rope bridge. Like, do you want to cross this rope bridge? It's got three ropes and some ropes down to the but connect the three ropes together and you walk on the one and you use your hands on no i really don't want to walk across that other than for bragging rights but what if there was a safety net underneath it well then we ask the question well how how far down is the safety net what's the strength of that safety net what can it handle what's its working load and its peak load um, how is this, this safety net put together? Is it properly suspended? For me, I'd like the safety net to be about a foot below the bridge at most and uh, to be properly suspended and nice and wide. Not like a hammock width. I've seen people fall out of those. A nice wide one, like the ones they shoot the human cannonball into in the circus. Nice wide net. Well, then, then I'm okay because I'm safe. And David says, God is my salvation. I might be walking in a dangerous situation, but I've got a safety net. I've got my salvation. The Lord is my salvation. He is my safety. He is my deliverance. Whom shall I fear? God's my protection. But also he says, the Lord was the strength of his life. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If we look at our own strength, we think, well, I know what I'm capable of. Or, as you get older, you'll understand this. I know what I think I'm capable of, and that may not be quite true anymore. I suppose youth have that problem too sometimes. It, we all think we're capable of more than we are. But if we're relying on our own strength, we have limits. As we loaded up firewood this week, none of the boys I brought with me or myself looked at any of those logs and thought, you know what, maybe... If each of us grab an end, we can just put this up on the trailer. I don't know what one of those logs would weigh, but um, I wouldn't want to find out either. We know we're limited in our strength. And David said, the Lord is the strength of my life. He wasn't reliant on his own strength. Uh, David had some strength to him. He had some ability to him, but he wasn't reliant in his strength. 
He didn't depend or rest in his strength, only God's. And we think about what we are capable of and we limit our situation to what we're capable of. Well, we're in a very difficult situation. I like to think sometimes I'm, I'm growing in my ability to repair cars. You know, I'm, I'm learning more every year and probably losing some ability to crawl under my car every year. I don't know. We haven't gotten that far yet. I'm still crawling underneath it. But I look and I say, I'm getting better. But you know, there's things on my car that I likely wouldn't tackle. I don't know what they, those would be, but there are things that, you know what, that's beyond me. I suppose if my transmission needed rebuilt, unless the car was completely bricked, I'm not going to take apart the transmission. Now, if it's completely bricked, taking apart the transmission sounds like fun. We're limited. But if God is the strength of our life, we're not limited strength-wise. God's not limited strength-wise. He's not like us. And, oh, well, that's a little, a little bit beyond my capacity. Then people ask the question, well, can God make a stone too big that he can't lift it? The answer is no. Oh, then God can't do anything, everything. Like, uh, yes, he can. Because he can lift any stone, he can't make a stone too big for him to lift. Um, he can do the impossible because nothing's impossible for God. But he can do everything that's possible consistent with his character. The Lord is the strength of my life. And if God is our light, our salvation, and our strength, we have nothing to fear. And then we look at the rest of the psalm, and there's uh, a couple of things that David tells us God is to him. First thing God, David tells us is God is, right now you're thinking, we're one verse in, it's been 15 minutes, and there's 14 more verses, or 13 more verses. Anyone do the math? That's really bad. That's like three hours and 15 minutes left if I were to continue at the same pace. I'm not going to continue at the same pace. Verse 2, David talks of God as his refuge. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came up upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock." David knew God was his refuge. He said, when my enemies come up, I have a place to go. And he talks about being in, that he may dwell in the house of the Lord. What was the house of the Lord in David's time? The tabernacle. Good, he didn't fall for the trick question because we're dealing with Israel. People would be tempted to say the temple, but Solomon built the temple. So there's no temple. He's like, I have a great refuge in the tabernacle. I have a, a giant tent I can go to. Here's why I don't think David's talking about going to a giant tent. There were parts of the tent that were off limits to the king. He talks about dwelling and hiding in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle. David's not talking about hiding himself in the Holy of Holies. Because if David was talking about that, then we don't have the same refuge that David had. Because we don't have a tabernacle. We don't have a temple. Oh, I say, but we have a church. And uh, it's a safe place to be. Well, I hope so. Uh, but I don't know that a church is going to stop our enemies from coming. David, as he's talking about dwelling in the house of the Lord, being in his tabernacle, being in his pavilion, he's speaking of of God being a refuge that even as his enemies rose up against him, he had a place that he could go. When uh, we were expecting Austin, the hospital told us we had to go to um, birth and delivery classes. And the ones they had at the hospital, we thought, eh, those don't sound so good. Are we able to sign up for ones we like? And they said, oh, sure, go to any ones you want. So we found this one, and we had to drive to Erie to get there. And uh, I can't remember if it was the first or the second time we were there, that the woman leading it says, now I want you all to close your eyes and go to your, your peaceful place. And 
so there we were for like five minutes and she's talking us through this and i don't know if it was five minutes or ten minutes it seemed like eight and a half hours and she said now open your eyes I'm like okay and we're all nice and relaxed and then she said where did you go I turned to jen and i was like i i don't know about you but i stayed here i've been here the whole time but what they were trying to teach was when the stress of childbirth comes upon you, it's good to be able to kind of remove yourself from the stress and go to your happy place. And David says, God is my happy place. Even when my enemies rise up against me, I have a refuge that I can go to, that I can remove myself. I want to be in the Lord's house. So the verse 6, he says, And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. A place to flee to, a place to be lifted up over his enemies, a place to hide, a place of safety. And yet, we know David struggled with many enemies over many years, many times in his life. So if he's lifted up over his enemies, why did he still struggle with them? Because he knew he had a refuge to go to when things were bad, when things were difficult. He had a place to be lifted up and a place that he could hide, and that place was in God's presence. And he could get to God's presence, whether he was in Jerusalem, whether he was in Hebron or wherever the tabernacle was at the time or not, he could go into God's presence. But also, we have nothing to fear because not only do we have a refuge, but we have a listening ear. Sometimes what causes us to fear is having no one to turn to. And David says, verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. David knew he had a listening ear in God. Though not only heard him, but actually heard him and would respond. I saw a video this week of a guy saying, listen, listen, honey. He was talking to his wife. I hear you. I'm listening to you. And she goes, oh, yeah, you do, you're doing both of those things? Really? Multitasking, huh? You're hearing and listening. David says, hear me, O Lord. When you said, seek my face, I said, Lord, your face I will seek. He knew he had a place to turn to, someone to listen to him, a listening ear, someone to seek, someone to go to. And then as we end the uh, chapter, maybe the most important thing about nothing to fear is when we go to God, we go to a God that has an answer to every solution, an answer to every problem. Sometimes you might look at a test before you in school and think, I don't have answers for some of these. I got to give out a test. One of the kids calls me over and goes, hey, Mr. Hadley, um, how do I do this? I said, well, it says simplify the expression. Now, for some of you, that may throw you into dizzying spells of, of, of um, convulsions. But I looked at it and I said, well, you need to simplify it. Well, yeah, I know, but what do I do? Like, um, I think that's what Miss Kinney's testing you on. <laughs> I said, but notice there's parentheses, so you need to get rid of the parentheses. You figure when you're teaching that, say, say that in a math class, people understand that to get rid of parentheses, you have to use the distributive property to multiply what's outside by what every term that's inside. This student did not get that. In fact, as I looked at her paper, she already had distributive written over the three problems that had parentheses. And it wasn't in the same handwriting the test was in. So I think Miss Kinney already gave her the help of the distributive property. Like, I don't think I can go beyond that help because if I tell you how to use the distributive property, I'm going beyond it. And there were some kids in those math classes that didn't have an answer to every problem. One kid goes, Mr. Hadley, I forgot my stickers in my locker. Can I go get them? Like, your, your stickers? Yes, we can earn stickers that we can put on a test to skip a question. Like, 
Do you have stickers that you can get more questions? Because questions are fun. They didn't appreciate my sense of humor. But God has a solution for every problem. There's no problem that stumps God. Sometimes I see those, those uh, problems on Facebook or on YouTube, and it's like, can you solve this? And I tell you, I could go down a rabbit hole solving those problems all day and trying to figure out how to solve them because they interest me. And I would want to solve them all before looking at the video because it's a challenge. And I have to kind of turn my back on that and understand that, you know what? I don't have to solve every problem that's out there, every math problem. But God's got an answer to every problem. Verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. You know, as I consider all the difficulties that David had, I don't remember his father and mother forsaking him. His sons forsook him, especially one. The king of Israel forsook him, turned his back on him. He had problems with other people. But David says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. He's got a problem of being forsaken, and God's got the solution for it. That's, that's a good problem to have a solution for. Verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain, in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And in there, some of the difficulties David says God has the answer for, enemies. Because of mine enemies, lead me in a plain path. Guide me clearly, Lord, because of mine enemies. Now, he says, don't deliver me over to the will of mine enemies because of false witnesses. God's got the solution for false witnesses, too. When people say things against us falsely, when they breathe out cruelty, when they're, they're out for blood, when they're, they, want, they want to take us down, God says, I've got the solution for it. I'd fainted unless I'd believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Well, I'd fainted. Well, when do we faint? Well, when things are overwhelming, when things are really bad. And David says, there's the goodness of the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. The problem of when we're fearing and we need courage, wait on the Lord. When our heart is weak, he will strengthen it. God has a solution for every problem. And you might say, well, I don't see my problem in there. Well, that's because David gave us a psalm in 14 verses instead of making this one like Psalm 119 and uh, making it a really long psalm. But he understood that he had nothing to fear because God had the solution for every problem. Well, what about this problem over here? Yeah, God's got the solution. Think about the problems in our world. Right now we've got war going on in Gaza between Israel and, and Hamas. Does God have the solution for that? Absolutely. I still remember might be 20 years ago now when, when they interviewed the terrorists that were firing missiles at Israel at one point, and they asked the terrorist leader, why, why don't you hit the targets you're aiming for? Is your technology that bad? And they said, no. Their God changes the direction of our missiles so that we don't hit what we're trying to hit. I thought that was great. It reminds me of Exodus 15. Our enemies will hear and they will fear. God's got a solution for every problem. Does he have a solution for the problems in Washington, D.C.? Yep. Does he have a solution for the problems of bad laws? Does he have a solution for problems of, of leadership that, that doesn't seem to follow God's path? Yep. Does he have a solution for our needs? Yes. Every last one of them. And as we look in Scripture, there's a name for God for every need that we might possibly have. We have nothing to fear. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Great verse to remind ourselves of the truths of God's word, that he's got a solution for every problem. He's ready and willing to meet our needs, and he's able to meet our needs. 
anytime and any place. We're going to close tonight with hymn number 503. What do we do with that truth? Well, hymn number 503, Jesus, I am resting, resting. We can rest in God knowing that he's got these things covered. Hymn number 503. <clears throat> Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what Thou art. I am finding out the greatness of Thy loving heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon Thee and Thy beauty fills my soul for by thy transforming power thou hast made me whole Jesus I am resting resting in the joy of what thou art I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart oh how great thy loving kindness vaster broader than the sea oh how marvelous thy goodness lavished all on me yes i rest in thee beloved know the wealth of grace is thine know thy certainty of promise and have made it mine jesus i am resting resting in the joy of what thou art i am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart simply trusting thee lord jesus i behold thee as thou art and thy love so pure so changeless satisfies my heart satisfies its deepest longings meet supplies its every need compasseth me round with blessing thine is love indeed jesus i am resting resting in the joy of what thou art i am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart ever lift thy face upon me as i work and wait for thee resting neath thy smile lord jesus earth's dark shadows flee brightness of my father's glory sunshine of my father's face keep me ever trusting resting fill me with thy grace jesus i am resting resting in the joy of what thou art i am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart father we are thankful for your loving heart towards us. We're thankful that when you are our light and our salvation, the strength of our life, we don't have anything to be afraid of. You're a refuge for us, not a physical place that we can go for safety, but 
always can come to your presence, always can come for your protection and your love and your mercy. Father, we're thankful as well that, that we know that we've always got an ear, a listening ear, to hear us when we cry out to you. And we know that that listening ear has a solution to every problem. Lord, there's many things in life that we could fear, that we're tempted to fear on a regular basis, but Scripture tells us you've not given us a spirit of fear, and David tells us that as he was resting in you, he had nothing, no one to fear and no one to be afraid of. Father, we pray that that would be a truth that we would live out as we rest in you, as we look to you, as we cry out to you. We'll ask you to bless and to uh, be pleased as we live our lives and make our choices this week. And we'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.